Welcome to everybody for coming out tonight. Uh, you're going to be spending the next hour or so of your life listening to a lawyer teach you how to sell. It's too late. Marjorie has bolted the doors. You cannot leave, at least for the next hour. Uh, and, and, and by the way, you're not the only ones, uh, by the way. I have a YouTube channel. I'm pleased to know, and it's not just about legal and tax stuff. I talk about all aspects of small business. That's sort of what I, that's, I'm considered a small business guru of some kind here around the country. Um, I've got 37 videos up there, uh, actually. And my, and my keystone video, uh, my, my most popular one, is a video on how to sell just about anything to just about anybody. Uh, I have, right about now, at the time we're, we're taping this, I have over 120 thousand views on that uh, on that YouTube video. I am a YouTube sensation, uh, believe it or not. I have strangers coming up to me in airports now who recognize me as, no seriously, I actually had a guy come up to me and he goes, it's you. And I said, yeah, still me. And he goes, you know, who are you? He goes, he goes, you're the guy in the purple sweater on YouTube. He had seen my video because I'm wearing this, this ugly, ugly sweater that sort of makes me look like Barney. Uh, so ever since that, the purple has been kind of my color. I, I, I've sort of adopted that now. There's kind of this uniform thing. It makes it stand out when you do the search engine stuff. Um, but the reason I mentioned that video, by the way, and it's, it's, a, it's something I'm, 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 I'm dealing with trepidation right now, because if you watch that video, if anybody here has seen that video, okay, if you do, uh, <laughs> um, if you have, at one point in the video, I actually say, in so many words, cold calling doesn't work. Don't do it. It's a waste of your time, and it's an insult to the people you're talking to. In fact, I even go as far as to say, and this is something you should never do in video, I actually say at one point, the one program I will never give, uh, unless I'm really paid a lot of money, is a program on how to be a more effective cold caller. Well, here we are. <laughs> like any politician, I have learned how to pivot shall we say. And it's a very hard thing to do for a guy my size, let me tell you that right now, it's a pivot on anything. It's just, not, it's, bad things happen when I try to do it. There is a place for cold calling in the marketing universe. I'm still not a big fan of it, I'm gonna warn you about that. I am not one of those people, rah, rah, you know, it's the way to go, it's what you should do, you'll overcome your fears, you'll do whatever. It is something you only do when you absolutely have to. But there is a way to do it, and it, there, there are ways to do it that can be effective. So that's what I'm gonna be talking about tonight. Uh, first of all, no, now do you believe I'm a lawyer, by the way? You, now, now you believe it. We lawyers always tell you what we're not going to do, and then we tell you what we're, what we're going to do. First of all, the obvious thing, I am not a SCORE employee or anything like that, so anything I say tonight is strictly me. SCORE's got nothing to do with it. Uh, but the more important one is the second one. Uh, I know some of you guys have questions, and we may get into some legal and tax stuff tonight. I don't know. Probably not. But if we do, uh, please don't take anything that I say as one-on-one -on -one advice. There is a very big difference between saying this is what the law is and this is what you should do. I really can't do the latter uh, in a one-hour program. So, I mean, if you want to, you know, hire me or talk to me off to this one side, that's perfectly fine. Uh, but anything I say tonight is just to be taken as general information, not as legal or tax advice. Uh, you can only do that by, by retaining me officially. Okay, so what is cold calling? A little loved part of the marketing process. How many people here have done cold calling at one point? Virtually everyone in this room. Notice my hand went up too. Uh, I, I did a lot of cold calling, especially when I, was, uh, when I was a younger man. Why do I say that I'm not a big fan of, of cold calling? Well, cold calling to me is the opposite of marketing. If you listen to my how to sell video, I talk about the right way to market, which is understand your customer, know your customer, go in there and develop a relationship with the customer and then let that, that determine what you sell, what the sales pitch is. Don't go in cold, learn about your customer, go in and tailor your pitch to who that person is as an individual. That is the most effective way to sell. Cold calling is the opposite of that. Cold calling is not driven by the customer. Cold calling is driven by your product or inventory. You have something to sell. It's too late to change that now. You can't tailor it to the individual customer, it's there. And what you have to do is find people who are interested in buying that specific thing that you have. I always tell people, uh, cold calling is, I got a basement full of dead fish right now that are rotting away by the minute. And I'm really so, I'm hoping that some of you guys are in the mood for a seafood dinner tonight. <laughs> That's cold calling. It's driven by my basement full of dead fish, not your appetites. 
and what, you're, what you want to eat for dinner tonight. That's what it's all about. And when I'm cold calling, I've got something I have to unload. And I gotta find people who are interested, and if I don't, I gotta make them interested somehow in this basement full of dead fish. Examples of cold callers, telemarketers, door-to-door -door salespeople, email spammers. What do you think of these people? Are these people on, on the top of your, of your popularity list? Do you go out of your way to network with people like this? Of course you don't, you hate these people. And the reason, one of the reasons you hate these people is because they're cold calling. They're calling you at a very busy, let's face it, we are all time starved these days. Everybody is. We have less and less time to live our lives. You know, so when you pick up the phone, call somebody, and there's somebody on the other line, one of those automated robocalls, you wince, don't you? That's what you do, because you know what's coming. Hey there, we're doing a survey on you. You know what's going on. You know, the robot voices and stuff like that. I really can't do those very effectively. But seriously, cold calling is a last resort. Don't do it unless you absolutely have to. But having said that, there are some places where it does work and where cold calling can be done very effectively. Great example, just this past Sunday. Sunday afternoon, I'm sitting at home, I'm getting ready for dinner, and there's this bang, 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 bang on the front door. Godzilla is at my front door looking to gain entry. So I figure, what the heck? I go to the door, I open it up, there's nobody there. I look down and there's this little girl, about that big, second or third grade. You know, and she's looking up at me, hi, I'm raising money from my school, I'm selling microwave popcorn. My parents are Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so. They live three doors down from you. How many boxes do you want? <laughs> I have to say, it was one of the most effective cold calls I think I have ever experienced, right? You gotta love that kid, right? I, by the way, I, I think that kid has a future in organized crime, uh, by the way. I think this kid has a future. I can see her as kind of like an enforcer. Um, you know, like for a repo man or something. I really can see her. I think she's got a future here. I told her parents that I'd be talking about her tonight, so they're probably gonna move. Uh, <laughs> this is what you do if you don't like your neighbors. Talk about their kids in a public forum anyway. But she was cute, and of course I bought a couple of, of course I bought a couple of boxes. Why? Well, I'm not gonna slam a door in a kid's face. I'm not gonna do that. I'm a decent human being, at least I think I am. But also, too, I don't want my neighbors mad at me, right? I don't want them saying, oh, Cliff, you know, he wouldn't buy, he was the only guy on the street that didn't buy, you know, boxes. I mean, let's put this, I need microwave popcorn like a hole in the head. But you know what? Halloween's coming. Guess what I'm going to be giving out? You guys can give out candy. I'm giving out microwave popcorn. <laughs> See, everything, there's always a synergy. You can always make use of anything you get. Okay. But seriously, the neighborhood kids who come around, especially this time of the year, they're doing all the fundraisers for school. Um, charitable solicitations from your neighbors. How many of you guys get a letter? You know, hi, I'm your neighbor down the street. I'm raising funds for the, fill in the name of your favorite charity, right? You always do that, you know, don't you? They always include the stamped envelope too, and you really hate not to do it because they wasted 46 cents on a stamp, you know, that kind of thing. Um, you know, guilt is a good, is a good tool to use uh, when you're doing cold calling, if you can do it effectively. And again, these are not strangers to me. These are neighbors, you know. Uh, the kids, you know, Halloween, trick-or-treaters. I mean, seriously, um, there's one kid who trick-or-treats our house. I have no idea who this kid is at all. I, I've never seen him. I've asked around the neighborhood. Nobody seems to know who this kid is. He probably lives in somewhere you know, a little far away from me. But he always comes around and says, you know, Mr. Aniko, I just want to let you know your lawn is always the best looking lawn in this entire neighborhood. Right? First of all, he's taken, he doesn't even pronounce my name right, but he took the care to figure out who I was, what my name was, and he's playing me this incredible comment. All the parents, all, everybody in our neighborhood says that you have the best lawn in the neighborhood. Of course he gets an extra candy bar. Hey, the kid earned it. You know, uh, flattery is another. You can learn a lot from those kids, by the way. Kids are, are just natural cold callers. They are. It's very hard to turn them down. But these are the techniques that work. Flattery, the fact that they know you, the fact that you don't want to be embarrassed, guilt. These are the things that sometimes work. At the cash register, you're at your local, you know, supermarket or, you know, uh, or drugstore, right? Would you like to give an extra $1 to name, and they always say it in that loud, irritating, piercing voice. You know, so that everybody in the store can hear it and they're all looking at you to see what you're gonna do, right? I mean, it's very hard to say, uh, okay, no, no, I mean, I do. I mean, I'll be honest with you, I don't care about that. You know, I think that's kind of an imposition. So I just say, look, you know, I've been, I've been hit up so many times this week, you know, especially now with the awareness month, you know, and all that stuff, everybody's doing stuff like that. So I just say, I'm really, I'm really kind of on overload right now. I'm gonna pass this time, you know, that I don't mind doing. I don't really care about that too much, but they do it specifically because they know it's hard for people to say no in that setting. Why do these techniques work? Well, they do, they work because there's something going on other than the sale of whatever the, the product is. 
right? I have no interest in this microwave popcorn. I am buying it because of some other reason. And you have to understand what that reason is. Uh, the most effective cold call I ever had, I'll, I'll share this with you, this is a war story. Uh, I was a young lawyer on Wall Street. I was actually working in building two of the World Trade Center. Uh, this was in the early 1980s. Um, and back then, we didn't have the internet, we didn't have computers, we had phones, but you had to answer the phone. We didn't even have answering machines, by the way. They didn't come along until the mid-80s. Um, you know, we had to answer, as lawyers, we had to answer our phones. That was a firm rule. That if the phone rang, we had to pick it up. And I was deluged every day by calls from people who wanted to sell me insurance, or specifically, they wanted to sell my clients insurance. They, they, they read somewhere that lawyers are a big influencer when, you know, people are looking to buy insurance for their small businesses, for their companies. So get a hold of the lawyers. Get on the lawyers list uh, of favored resources. That's one of the things that they teach these young insurance people who are, like, fresh out of college, right? And I used to hang up on them. I mean, I was pretty brutal. And I'd say, hi, I'm so-and-so from insurance. Bang. Down. You know, that's it. I, I mean, I don't have time to waste. I bill it, you know. Back then it was 200 bucks an hour. <laughs> now it's a little bit more than that. Uh, you know, I'm not going to waste my time talking to this bozo, whoever he is. But there was this one time I got a call and I picked up the phone. And he goes, hi, uh, just so you know, my name is Joe. Uh, I'm, I'm working over in the building next door and I want to take you out to lunch. Hello, this is different. So I said, take me out. To, what, what, what's, what's going on? Who are you? He goes, look, let me tell you the story. Uh, I just got out of college. I just started working over here. I'm working for one of the insurance companies over here in building one of the World Trade Center. You know, they, they, they want me to call lawyers and try to ask them all kinds of questions about what kind of insurance their clients are, are, are needing and stuff. I don't really know what I'm doing. Uh, you know, I'm starting out here. I've called, a, I've tried to call a few lawyers. I can't even get past the secretary. You're the first one, I think, who's the guy who's picked up the phone. Listen, I, I need your help. I, I'm not going to try to sell you anything. I really don't feel that I can do it. I don't feel confident enough to do this. What I'd like to do is take you out to lunch. My treat, we can go to one of the restaurants here locally. Please don't hit me too hard. I'm, I'm just starting out. You know, but I just want to get some information about people like you, young lawyers. You know, what are you looking for? What kind of clients do you represent? I mean, I don't want to waste your time. I don't want to waste mine either, but I need to learn how to speak to people like you. And the people I work with here can't do this. So I'm, I'm asking several lawyers in the buildings here if they would mind, mind having lunch and help mentor me. That was, very, it was a very hard, it was a very different way to go about it, wasn't it? First of all, well, he did two things. He offered to treat me to lunch. Obviously a good thing to do, a good icebreaker with somebody like me. You know, a free lunch is something I very rarely say no to. But also too, he was appealing to my vanity, wasn't he? He was holding me up as an expert on what young lawyers are looking for, which, of course, if you want to, if you want to sell a lawyer, appeal to, appealing to his vanity, his or her vanity, is probably one of the better ways to do it, uh, I would think. We are accused of having a certain amount of ego, uh, and some of that's actually true. So he knew a little bit more about lawyers than he was letting us. So I actually did have lunch with this young man. Very nice guy. Had a very nice lunch. Talked about some things. He gave me some ideas, too, actually, you know, of, of how to deal with the insurance people when they call. And I actually, I mean, I personally didn't use him, but I actually referred him to some of the other uh, younger attorneys uh, in my network. And he actually got some business out of that. Um, so that's, that is an effective cold call. And I don't feel he did anything improper, unethical, or in your face by doing that. He was very sincere. I don't know what I'm doing. Before I can do this effectively, I've got to learn how I need people like you to teach me. Uh, and I'm perfectly happy to pay the cost of a few lunches uh, to, to get what I need so that uh, so my calling becomes more effective. Whenever you're selling to people you don't know, find out about them first. And if you don't know them at all, cold call them but ask them out to lunch and just get information. Don't, he didn't try to sell me on that first lunch. He was very good about that. He didn't try to sell me insurance. He was very sincere. He wanted to learn how to do his job better. And I helped make him a better insurance uh, person. He actually became one of the top performers at his, uh, at his agency, uh, although it was years later. I, I still keep in touch with him, actually. So it can work, but if you don't know, if you don't know who you're talking to, just saying, hi, I'm so-and-so and I sell life insurance is not going to work. Don't waste your time. Okay, here are the keys to success in cold calling. Number one, don't do it cold. Don't do it cold. Prepare, prepare, prepare. Know something about the people you're dealing with. You can find out so much about people now on the internet. 
Uh, shame on you if you don't do a little basic you know, Google search on somebody and see what they're into. Look at their, look at their Facebook page. Look at their LinkedIn page. Find out who these people are. Look for some points of common interest. Look for fears and passions. You'll, if you watch my How to Sell video, I talk a lot about this. Find out what turns them on. Find out what worries them, what turns them on at night. These are the two things that people love to talk about. Find those things. If you just look at the, at the basic information on the Internet, you should be able to get a sense of that. Uh, prepare, and when you go into that, because what you need to do if you're cold calling someone is you need to have a hook. And you have no idea what the, how the hook is going to work or what the hook should be unless you know something about the person you're talking to. So do a little research. Try not to sell to strangers, people you don't know. If you are selling to strangers, you, your hook has to be three times as good as it, as it has to be if you're talking to somebody you at least have some, some notion of. Know your customer, know your product or service cold. Know all of its features. Don't know, don't just look at the superficial stuff. Find out all the things it does. A box of Arm & Hammer baking soda can also, uh, is, is a great way to keep odors out of your refrigerator, but it's also an antique. They've been making this stuff for 100 years. And there's a lot of antique boxes on the, uh, on the web, too. Uh, some people collect them because of the, the graphic art and stuff like that. Uh, know all the uses that your product has, because his chances are that while your, your, your customer may not want the main one, he may want one of the others. Develop a hook and prepare to handle rejection, lots of it. You are going to be rejected nine times out of ten, maybe more. Be prepared for that. It's not a very effective technique. Be realistic about what you're going to get out of it. Okay, so now let's talk about what motivates your customer, okay? When you're making a sales pitch, it, the first 15 seconds are critical, and I'll tell you why in a minute. When you make a sales pitch, you have to lead with people's fears passion, and passions, not needs and wants. One of the dirty little secrets of small business, people do not buy things they need because they need them. Seldom, if ever, do they buy things because they need them or wants. The two things that motivate people to buy things, it's either they turn them on in some way, they get them excited, they tie into a passion that the person has, or they hel it helps them sleep better at nights. It helps them reduce their fears and anxieties about something or other. You need to know what those fears and passions are, and that's what you lead with. You never talk about the product. The biggest mistake that salespeople of all kinds make, not just cold callers, is they start talking too soon about their inventory, about their product. Start talking about the customer. Talk about the things that turns them on. Talk about the things that worry them, because that's what people love to talk about. Think about this. When you're with your friends or at work, you know, talking to your colleagues or with your family at Thanksgiving, what do you spend most of your time talking about with these folks? You spend your time talking about the things that you're excited about, the things that turn you on, and the things you worry about. Maybe the election next month. Right? This is what you spend all your time talking about. And these are the two things that people love to talk about. In fact, psychologists tell us this is how we pick our friends and sometimes our lovers. It's very hard to like or love someone who does not share or at least empathize with your fears and passions. I'm not saying you hate them. I'm just saying you just don't get them. That's all. It's much easier to like someone if they share or at least empathize with your fears and passions. You're much more attracted to them. You're much more likely to be attracted to them. And they're much more likely to be attracted to you if you show that you care about the things that they love and the things that they worry about, that you're a simpatico. That is the way that you, that you get a customer to, to not, not to slam a door in your face. That is the idea here. You know, but the, the, uh, the, gentleman, the young gentleman, the insurance agent, he appealed to my vanity. He said, listen, I really think that you're a guy who can help me, you know, and develop in my career. I'm looking for you to mentor me. He was seeing me as a mentor, not as a customer. That's very flattering to a young lawyer who's only two or three years out of law school. Let me tell you about that. Most people don't think we have a brain in our heads at that stage. Uh, so he paid me a real compliment there, and he really did appeal to, to something to, uh, to me. I, I definitely wanted to spend more time with this guy. Um, it's all about the fears and the passions. Uh, seriously, a guy named Dale Carnegie wrote a book about this 100 years ago. This is nothing new that I'm talking about. If you watch my How to Sell video, I actually have a whole section on, on fears and passions and how important they are. You have to know, about the, and if you don't know the fears and the passions of this specific individual, you need to know the fears and passions of people who are like them. So right now, I live in Fairfield. What do you think, you know, just next door here. What do you think one of, you know, a typical Fairfield homeowner's fears is right now? Uh, just, just, you know, fear of, you know, 
real, estate, real property values because GE, the GE headquarters, is moving up to Massachusetts. We're all worried about our property values and should we sell now, should we sell next year? If you're a realtor cold calling me into selling my house, what do you think you should be talking about in those first critical few seconds? I don't think you should be talking about my house or who you are or your credentials or whatever. You should be talking about the environment in Fairfield and how you can help me get the best price for my house and what's a very, what is a very uncertain market in Fairfield right now. That's a good example of that. Um, okay, as again, this is, and that's by the way, that is the link. If you want to see my how to sell video, uh, you go to youtube.com and you can either search for me, but if you can't remember my name, just search for how to sell. Uh, it's one of the top 10 videos that will show up on that list, and you'll see I have a whole section on this. Or maybe it's these. I, I, I have to say, do you know who Dave Eggers is? He's a, a famous novelist. He writes a lot of books, and he writes a lot of books on social trends and things that are going on. They're all novels, but they're all based on things that are happening now. So, for example, he, has a, he had a bestseller a couple of years ago called The Circle about a social media company and how it impacts on society and stuff like that. Very great writer, actually one of my favorite writers. Well, he wrote a book about 10 years ago called A Hologram for the King. And it actually was just made into a movie uh, earlier this year with uh, Tom Hanks. Some of you may have seen it. Anybody seen the movie? by the way. It's actually a fascinating book. Uh, it's about this middle-aged, you know, baby boomer uh, salesperson. He's been selling for different companies his entire life, and he's going over to Saudi. He's doing a, a contract job for a company that does holographic communication systems. You know, things where you can actually see the, the, the person in like a 3D uh, thing, like a hologram. And he is trying over in Saudi Arabia trying to sell this high-end system to the Saudi government, to the Saudi uh, royal family. And the book is really about America and its decline in, the, in, in world commerce. It's about the decline of manufacturing. Uh, some people have actually compared the main character, uh, the Tom Hanks character, to Willie Loman in Death of a Salesman. It's like an updated version of Death of a Salesman. Very, very great book. Uh, well, in one scene in the book, he reminisces about being, when he first came out of school, in high school, he worked for, uh, as a fuller brush salesman. Remember those guys? They used to do, go door to door selling household cleaning products. And his boss, his mentor, was a guy who told him at one point, there's only four reasons in this world why anybody buys anything. And when you pitch to someone, when, you, when they open the door, the first words that come out of your mouth has to be one of these four things. You've got to size that person up quickly and kind of hit one of these four things, whatever they are. And these are the four things. I apologize for the small type. If you want to take a picture of this slide, I'm perfectly cool with that. Um, money, appeal to their thrift. Fuller brush products will save them money by preserving their investments, their wood furniture, their china, their linoleum floors. That's one thing, money. You know, you'll save money with our product. Romance, here you sell the dream. You put the fuller brush products in among their aspirations, right there to the vacations and yachts. Our products will save you time. You'll have more time for the things in life that you really love to do, your favorite charity, whatever it is that you like to do. Self-preservation. If they're afraid to let you in, if they talk to you through the window or something, you go with this way. Fuller brush products will keep you healthy, safe from germs, diseases. You go for the safety play. And then last but not least, recognition. He or she wants to buy what everybody else is buying. You pick the four or five names of the most respected neighbors and say those folks already bought Fuller Brush. Okay, how many do you want? That's what the little girl did to me with the, uh, with the microwave popcorn. I, get, I offer this, this is just an alternative view uh, to what's in my how to sell video, but it's, it's, I think it's an interesting view and it's, it's coming from somebody, obviously Dave Eggers had some knowledge of this. Uh, I did a little research and I discovered that his father was a, a fuller brush salesman, so he actually knew uh, about this. So this is coming from the old door-to-door -door salesman, the old school door-to-door -door salesman. It's something worth listening to. Uh, it's another view, and by the way, the holo if you ever really want to learn about the downside of selling, especially uh, international selling, foreign selling, A Hologram for the King is just a great book to read on that. Um, now, we talk about your hook. Turn them on or scare them. Selling is all of any kind, not just cold calling, is all about bringing people's fears and passions into the present moment. So right now, you've all got fears, you've all got passions, but you're not thinking about those now. You're just figuring, you know, when is this guy going to shut up so I can go out and have, go home and have dinner? or whatever it is. You're not really thinking about these things right now. If I'm trying to sell you something, I gotta take one of those fears or passions and I gotta put it right here in the present. I gotta, I, gotta, I gotta make you feel it. I gotta get you to the point where I can just look in your beady little eyes and say, oh, they're feeling it right now. They're feeling that fear, that passion right now, here in the present moment. Uh, when I try to sell audiences, this is what I try to do too. Uh, I mean, that's why I'm a little offbeat. I, I use you know, offbeat humor. I kinda want you sitting on the edge of your seats knowing what is this crazy guy gonna say next? 
That's kind of what, what my, my, my game plan is as a speaker. That's how I try to hold your attention. It's selling, too, uh, to a certain point. I'm selling you right now uh, to a certain extent, although I'm not so sure what the product is. Uh, but I am selling something here. Um, be dramatic, be funny. A, there's an old saying in my profession, in the legal profession, a laughing jury never convicts. And that is very true. If you know how to make people laugh, and if you can get them to laugh within the first two seconds or 15 seconds of your presentation, they'll keep the door open long enough to listen more to what you have to say. Your goal as a cold caller is, to, is those first 10 to 15 seconds to keep that person from hanging up on you, to keep that person from putting uh, in the, your, your email in their spam folder, uh, to, 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 to not, to not, to not slam, slam the door in your face if you're doing it one-on-one. -on -one. That is your goal. Your goal during the first 10 seconds of a cold call is not to sell. The first, the goal is not to get rejected, not to have the conversation ended at that point. To keep the conversation going long enough that you can at least get out what it is you're trying to do. That is the biggest challenge with any kind of cold calling uh, enterprise, is to get past those first few, and the hook is all important. Turn them on, scare them, talk about their fears and passions, be dramatic or funny, spark their curiosity, be memorable, do the unexpected. The young insurance guy asking, taking me out to lunch. Hi, I'm so-and-so, you don't know me, but I want to take you out to lunch. Hello, I'm not going to hang up on that. I want to, I want to hear more. This, this is interesting, this is different. If you're doing email, right, and, you know, I'm looking at all the emails and I see an email that's, that says, your least favorite candidate, fill in the blank, has just done something else really awful. Watch about it, you know. Are you gonna, are you gonna, are you gonna just put that one in the delete box? You're probably gonna wanna open that one, aren't you? you wanna, you're a little curious. I piqued your curiosity, haven't I? You know, you're probably gonna open that message, aren't you? That's the hook with email. The, the header line is everything in email. In cold calling, it's the first few words that come out of your mouth. What most telemarketers do, what do they do when they call you up? Hi, how you doing today? The minute you hear that, you know it's a cold call. But how about, hey Cliff, listen, uh, are you going to the SCORE meeting on Thursday? Uh, who is this now? I mean, is this, is this, you know, is this Brian Baxendale? Who is this, who's this that's calling me? You know, the head of the local SCORE chapter. What is it? What's, who is this person? They, they obviously know I'm speaking. Of course, be careful. If you know too much about the person, you're a stalker. Uh, so just be careful about that. You can go a little too far. Listen, I see you just got out of the shower. <laughs> Wait a minute, you know, how'd you do that? You know, is there a webcam in here? What the heck's going on here? I mean, I, I know that there's no privacy on the internet, but dude, I mean, this is really heavy. Um, anyway, be memorable. There's a book called Purple Cow by Seth Godin, who's kind of a marketing guru. He talks about the different ways that you can be memorable in a, in a good way. Not memorable in a, holy cow, this guy looks like a, like a, like a serial killer. I'm calling the cops. You know, there's, you know be, you, there, there are positive and negative ways to be memorable. But you can't just do the normal thing. Um, and again, the critical first 15 seconds. The, why do I, I keep stressing this? I keep stressing this because I've spoken to salespeople, I've spoken to sales experts, people who've written books on this stuff, and they all say the same thing. Most decisions to buy something are made within 15 seconds or less. When you see something and you make up your mind to buy it, that time lag is only about 10 to 15 seconds, maybe even sometimes less. The more you have to think about something, the more likely you are to talk yourself out of it. People do not talk themselves into buying decisions. They talk themselves out of things. Uh, I, I have had salespeople who tell me, if I'm pitching somebody at a networking thing or something, and after 10 seconds they haven't said yes, I, I make my excuses and I go on to the next person. I don't waste my time anymore. Uh, the, the, the more you talk about why people need your thing, why you, they, what's good about it, what's bad about it, they're, they're, they're looking for ways to say no. Uh, that's it. If you don't hit them right between the eyes uh, with your sales pitch immediately, it doesn't happen. That little girl took 10 seconds or less to tell me the whole, the whole scenario of why she was at my door. That's all it took her was 10 seconds. And she did a very good, a very good job of that. Appearance and demeanor are very important, okay? Um, I had a guy come to my door about three weeks ago. He was trying to sell me, I don't know, he was, wanted me to sign a petition for some cause. I, I don't even know what it was. I didn't let him get that far. He came to my door, and he looked like he had just walked out of Woodstock, basically. He had this, you know, dirty hoodie on. 
Uh, he had this big bushy beard and the hair all over the place. He didn't even try to put it back into a ponytail. I can handle ponytails, but you know, he, he did. He was like all over this place. You know, he had this thing, this, 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 this thing that was going like, you know, the Bride of Frankenstein. You know, he had those little, the little John Lennon granny glasses, and he was wearing the Birkenstocks and stuff like that. Right? Take a good look at me. All right, this guy and me are not really on the same page, are we? <laughs> all right, we're not. Look, care about your appearance, okay? Why is it that when the religious solicitors come to your door, they're always dressed like they just got out of church? There's a reason for that, right? You, you feel more comfortable dealing with those people. Maybe you shouldn't, but you, you, you feel more comfortable with those people. Watch your appearance, watch your demeanor, look like your customers, okay? Be polite. You know, the minute you open a conversation with, dude, you've lost somebody, you've lost me, with something like that. You know, speak, you know, real English uh, when you speak. Don't waste time. How you doing today? Well, man, I hate when people do that. You know it's a sales call, all right? You know, just lead with your hook and keep me, keep me with the door open. You know, don't say, hi, we're from the, don't, no, that, that's, you're, you're leading with your product. Say, you know, excuse me, Mr. Renico, we, 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 we know you're a local lawyer in the community and we, we deal with a lot of lawyers and we just have a couple of questions for you about, about you know, where you think your practice is gonna be in five years. Uh, you know, could you, could you possibly help us out with this? That's a little bit better. I, I might keep that door open for a few more seconds just for the curiosity of where's this gonna go next? You know, what are they, what are they doing? What are they trying to sell me? Uh, I might do that. Work on your hook. The hook is that first five or 10 seconds is all important when you do it. Talk fears and passions, not products or services. And, and don't even talk about products, sell solutions. Sell solutions. Look. You're like most homeowners in Fairfield, we know you're all worried about the GE thing leaving. We have some solutions for people to make sure that when you do go to sell your home, you'll, you, the home will not be sitting on the market for six months. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about this, where we're talking to a lot of homeowners in the neighborhood. We spoke to your neighbor across the street who told us specifically that you'd be interested in hearing more about this. Say things like that. That's what keeps the door open. That's what all you're trying to do at that point is to avoid getting a door slammed in your face. Lose your script. Don't try to read from, I can tell when a salesperson is reading from a script and I think most people can too. Engage the customer, make a human contact, get that person to like you. And the way you do it is by talking fears and passions, okay? After the first 15 seconds, if you're lucky enough, if the door hasn't slammed, the person hasn't hung up and the email is still, you actually get a reply to your email, focus the conversation to a fear or a passion for which your product or service offers the solution. I frankly hate salespeople who wanna talk about the election right now I hate them because really, I mean, we all love talking about it, of course, but I mean, I don't really have a solution. You know, they don't really have a solution for my problem. You know, what I really want is someone who can tell me how to vote in another month is what I'm looking for. And they don't really have that at all. That's not, they're trying to sell me something else, which I'm really, I really don't care about. So why even talk about that? Focus on a fear or a, on a, on a fear or a passion for which your product or service offers the solution and don't start pitching until you see the customer has swallowed the hook. Once you've made the human contact, once they're listening, once they're focused, that's when you can say, okay, well, you know what? I, gotta, I, I, I have something that can help you, believe it or not. Because don't believe it, believe it you, you know, there's a famous old cartoon, and I love it. I don't know where it comes from. I don't know if it's from the New Yorker or someplace like that, but it shows this, this sort of elderly man, and he's trying to cut down this gigantic redwood tree or some huge tree using a tiny little ax that's only a little bit bigger than his hand. He's chopping away at this, and there's a guy standing behind him with a chainsaw who's trying to get his attention, trying to say, you know, this, this will help you, you know? And the, and the guy with the hatchet is saying, look, don't bother me now, can't you see I'm busy? That's the attitude that you have to have, is you're the guy with the chainsaw here. You have, this person is trying to do something that can be done a lot easier with what you have to offer, but first you gotta get that person's attention. If that person doesn't get, you don't get that person's attention, you're not gonna sell him this thing even though he obviously needs it and he'll, his, his life will be a lot better if he has this chainsaw. He'll have that tree cut down in a few minutes rather than several days the way he's going. You have to believe 
that your product or service is a solution to a problem. And you talk about the problem, and then you talk about the solution, and only when you see the customers bought into that, well, yes, I guess you're right, I really could use something that will help me cut down this tree a lot faster. That's when you say, well, there's this thing called a chainsaw. Let me show you the, what I'm selling them. This is how it works. This is how it does it. Or there's this, this new nutrition system. You can lose 50 pounds in a month. You know, this, is, this will help you get there. It's tested, it's proved. We can show you the testimonials and all this kind of stuff. That's when you open your mouth and start pitching. You don't start pitching until you know the person has bought into the fact that they have a problem and they need help with it. That's the key. When you're beginning a cold call, you talk about the problem and alternative solutions, and then you talk about, here's, here's what I got that can help you. Then at that point, he's pre-sold. He'll listen to you at that point. You're not likely to get the door slammed in your face because you've pre-qualified it. Um, don't bait and switch. People hate that. You start out talking about one thing, and all of a sudden you realize it's about something wholly different. Remember Amway years ago? They used to do this a lot. They never talked about who they were. They never said who they were, because the minute you heard the word Amway, you knew, boom, cold calling, you know, something like that. And their products were actually quite good. Remember? Their products were actually quite good. And all organic, too, which, you know, was a big thing nowadays. They were doing it years ago before that became a big thing. Or many of them were, I know. Uh, but the whole point was, they used to say, they used to say, you know, wouldn't you like this that would do this for you? Wouldn't you like a product that would do this for you? Well, I sell those products. And only at the very last minute did they say who they were. And they they say, oh, man. You know, slam. Don't bait and switch. People hate that. Uh, don't be afraid to ask for the sale, or even better, the best sales technique is not to even ask for the sale. Just assume that the sale has already taken place. The little girl who sold me the microwave popcorn, she didn't ask, you know, she didn't really ask for the sale. She just said, how many boxes do you want? It wasn't a question of whether I was going to buy microwave popcorn. It was about how many boxes, what the order size was going to be. That's a great technique, and a lot of salespeople do that. Listen, how many boxes can I put you down for? Can I, can, I, can I put you down for the coconut? The coconut's really our best seller right now. Everybody seems to be buying the coconut candy, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, don't even ask saying, would you want to buy it? Because then it gives them a chance to say no. Just assume the sale has taken place and make it about the details, uh, the, the order terms. All right, now let's talk about some specific types of cold calls. I promised you I'd give you some specific tips for specific environments. Uh, networking leads. Okay, somebody says, hey, you should call my friend Cliff Enico. Uh, he may help you to get a job, or he's a lawyer. He might be able to, you know, you think about writing a law book. He's done a bunch of them. He might be able to tell you how to do it. Um, first of all, get your lead to make the introduction. Um, I mean, I, I know a lot of people who say, who call up people and say, uh, my lawyer's Cliff Enico. And, you know, he thought that I would, uh, I, would, I would benefit from talking to you. And, in fact, I have said no such thing. They just found out that you know that I know this person, so they're using my name in vain. I don't like that. If that ever gets back to me, the, 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 the response is usually a very negative one. Always get the lead to make the call. If I get an email from someone saying, hey, Cliff, from a, from a client especially, or from one of the score counselors saying, hey, uh, Cliff, you're going to be getting a call from so-and-so. Look, she's one of my really best clients. She's got a real problem here. She needs somebody's help. If you can't help her, could you please point her in the right direction? I mean, I will always take the time and do stuff like that. But only if I know it's from you. I want to know you know this person. Right? I want to know this is actually coming from you and not just you know, somebody who got your name out of, a, out of a phone directory or something like that, because people do that, unfortunately, especially when they're desperate. Um, always try to get up close and personal. Try to get in the person's face. No phone, no email. Take them out to lunch, go to a deli, do something. Let's, let's go have a cup of coffee. That's the, the classic line that they use you. Can I treat you to a cup of coffee or something like that? We'll go to a Starbucks or something like that. Um, get on the same side of the table. It's not you versus me, it's you and me versus a problem. I've got this problem here and I really need your help to solve it. Between the two of us, do you think, let me think of any creative ways where maybe we might be able to do this a little bit differently than the way I'm doing it. Uh, you know, it, it's, it, get on the same side of the thing. Don't make it you know, a, a cross. In fact, I actually, whenever I, I, I'm doing a networking thing with someone, I never sit directly across from them. I sit at the 90 degree angle to them. So that we're sort of like shoulder to shoulder. I actually prefer that. It makes, it makes me like we're on the same side. It's just a very graphic way of saying we're on the same side here. Uh, you know, I'm not going to ask you to do anything that's going to make you uncomfortable. Um, and I, I am in positions like this. When I'm, when I'm negotiating for speaking gigs, usually, I'm in, in this situation where uh, I'm meeting with the corporate executives who want to hire me to talk to their staff and stuff like that. You know, I always try, I never just sit directly across from them. It's too much like a job interview. I try to sit catty corner to them so that, look, here's how I think your staff will benefit from, you know, this talk that I'm giving on social media and the law, uh, that I'm, that I'm, which I do, by the way, for HR departments around the country. I, I do do that. That's one of the things I do about how, when, they, when can they fire someone because they do something 
something stupid on social media. That's actually a very hot topic in the law right now. And a lot of HR departments are wrestling with that. So they pay for experts to come in, and that's where I try to fit in. So this is where I'm, this is where I'm cold calling, uh, or, or hopefully not cold calling. Hopefully I'm going in with an introduction or a reputation. Um, you know, give the person something in return for their time. I do this a lot, of course. I've written 18 books. I got a basement full of them. My wife is very anxious for me to clean out this basement. Uh, so whenever I know, seriously, whenever I do a network, hey, listen, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me. Here's a copy, an autographed copy of uh, my new book on crowdfunding. Really? You wrote a whole book on crowdfunding? Instant credibility. I don't have to sell myself anymore by doing that. Uh, you know, I did something unexpected. It was nice. I thank them in advance. You know, they haven't even done anything for me yet. They may kick me out of the office two seconds later, but I gave them something, and it's like an instant credibility. You've written, you've written 15 books? How bad can I be? Right? And that's, you know, I'm selling, but I'm doing it in, in a very indirect way. And also, it's the unexpected. People don't expect people to walk in and give them something for nothing. Um, that's an important thing, by the way, with junk mail. We'll talk about that in a minute. Always say thank you, ask for more leads. You know, ask for more introductions, keep the daisy chain going, try to get to more and more people. And always, people don't do this, follow up with the person who gave you the lead. I hate it when I say to somebody, hey, listen, you've got a trademark problem here, talk to so-and-so, she's a great trademark lawyer, and uh, I know you'll have a good experience with her. I hate it when I don't get a call back saying how it went. Well, how did it go? Did you, know, did you find somebody else? Did you, was she awful? I mean, you know, give me some feedback here. You know, call me back. Uh, let me know. Always follow up with the person who gave you the lead. You know, uh, even if it's just a thank you, just call us and say, look, just let you know, great meeting, thank you so much for doing this. I mean, that gives me the encouragement to do this for other people. You know, if I hear that, if you hear that feedback, oh, okay, everybody seems to like her. I'll, I'll start sending more trademark stuff her that way. That helps me, you know, manage, manage what I do a lot better. Okay, networking meetings. How many people here belong to one? Okay, a couple people, okay. Here's my advice on, I speak to at least 20 networking meetings a year, at least, uh, mostly in this area here in southern New England. Try not to join them. Speak to them instead. Seriously, uh, I, I mean, I, I find, first of all, by speaking to them, they, they very rarely say, say no. Networking meetings are always looking for people to come in and talk to them about topics, about just about anything that, that is relevant to whatever they're doing, right? By, by, by casting a few pieces of bread on the water, you probably can speak to at least five or 10 networking meetings a year, and you don't have to join them, which means th there's two good things about that. You, you, you'll, you, you'll keep your weight under control, which is very important, because they always have them at restaurants or breakfast places or something like that. But also, too, um, you get to, you'll get to see the same people over and over and over again. If you belong to the networking group, the only people you see are people in the group. The only fresh meat that you ever see is the person who's coming in and speaking to the group each month or each week or whatever it is. By being a speaker, you get to see everybody that's out there and there's no lasting commitment. You can cherry pick the people you wanna know more about and the people you don't wanna know more about. At least that's the technique that I use. Um, I have a very specific technique that I use in networking meetings. When people ask for my card, I say no. Right? I mean, you, you ever been to one of these networking meetings? For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, these are the kind of things where it's kind of like a meat market or speed dating. You kind of go in there, and the first thing you know, there's like five people at the door all trying to give you their cards. Hi, I'm Joe Blow. I sell life insurance. Hi, I'm so and so. I got an organizing business. I'm so and so. You know what I'm talking about right here? And it, it's, it's just, it's overwhelming, and it's also a little offensive, too. Um, you know, so my approach is well, hold it. Let's, you know, hang on a second. I'm going to be here for a little bit. I do want to get to know you guys a little bit better. But before I give any of you my cards, I mean, right now, I really don't know you. You know, I mean, and, and I, business cards are cheap. I know that they don't cost anything, but but I don't want to give, I don't want to waste your time, and I also don't want to waste any of my clients' time or anything like that. So before I give it to you, let's just let's spend a minute. Let's just chat about what you do, how you do it, what do you do that's better than anything else. I got a whole list of stock questions that I use here, and if I really think that you might be able to help somebody, I will ask you for your card, and sometimes I do. You know, if they can convince me they got something like this, well, I know this client, he really could use somebody like this in his life. It actually happened just recently. Um, I had a guy send, I met a guy at a networking meeting who was a social worker who was um, uh, dealing with, um, uh, he was a, a grieving, a grievance, a grief counselor, a grief counselor, right? And so I, I kind of thought that he was kind of an interesting guy. I don't know too many people like that. So I took his card and two days later, I got an email from another lawyer who I know very well uh, in upstate Connecticut, uh, whose wife just passed away very suddenly, and he was going through a tough time. And he says, do you know anybody locally here in Connecticut who does grief counseling? I mean, that kind of stuff happens, you know? And you know, it, it can happen that way. And that's what you're hoping will happen, of course. And of course, I gave him the guy's name. I have no idea if he's any good or not, but he was the only one I knew. 
Um, you know, try to be different. Try to talk. Try to be somebody that nobody else does. In every networking group in New England, there are three insur at least three insurance people. I think it's a law that to have a networking group, you have to have at least three insurance people in the group. I think there's, there's, there's got to be a law somewhere that says you have to have that, because they're everywhere. If you're selling life insurance, don't do networking. There's always somebody there who's already in the group. Try to do something a little different, you know, that nobody else does, and that you might, you might be able to fit into somebody's network just a little bit better that way. Um, keep the focus on the other person. Learn, learn as much about them as possible, and if they can't help you, move on quickly. Watch out for the time vampires that want to suck you into a 15, 20 minute conversation talking about something you don't really care about. If you really, once you get to the point where you know, and usually you'll know it in a couple of minutes, you know, this person really has nothing going on, find a polite way to move on. I mean, you know, I have a bunch of techniques that I use for that. I mean, one of mine is, you know what, there's somebody over there in the corner. I have not seen this guy in six months and I really need to talk to him. Excuse me, I'll come back to you later. Of course, I never do. Um, but that's, my, that's one of my little tricks that I use. You'll, you'll develop tricks for doing this. Why will they remember you in 24 hours? I'll, I'll share with you. When I go to a networking meeting, people always hand me tons of cards, right? What I do with them, I take them home. I don't throw them right away. I don't throw them away right away. I take them home. I leave them by my desk. I have a good night's sleep. And midway through the next day, about 24 hours after I've had this meeting, I go through the cards and I try to visualize what the person looks like. If I can't do it, I toss it. If I can, I might look at that card a little bit more. And I keep doing that every day. What made this person memorable? Why do I remember this person, but I don't remember any of these others? If I don't remember who you were, if I don't remember what you were all about, if I don't remember our conversation, I'm not going to keep your card. Uh, I'm going to throw it away. Okay? So be memorable. Try to tell, I mean, I always try to tell people at least one story that they'll remember for days afterwards. Um, you know, something, I mean, something, something, it's a little something that's off the wall. It, it doesn't have to be something that's directly relevant to what you do. But do a little something so when, so, so when an opportunity comes up five days later, he says, wait a minute, that guy that was at the networking meeting last month, he had that story about, yeah, yeah, this is the guy that I should, I should try to find, and then they'll try to find you. Uh, that's what you're hoping about. Okay. Success in junk mail. Um, I have a very dear friend, actually, she's a marketing expert up in, biz, up in Bridgeport who focuses on junk mail and direct mail solicitations. She's absolutely marvelous. And she taught me some of these things. First of all, vet your mailing lists. She tells me all the time, she lives in a condo in Bridgeport. She lives on the 19th floor of this condo. Every day, she gets junk mail from landscapers and swimming pool people and all of that and she says you know i mean i do have a little patio i mean it's about 10 feet by about 10 feet square but it's not really big enough for a, for a swimming pool and there's no, there's no grass there you know clearly these companies and uh, you, you all get this right they don't know who you are right i mean if it said but if it, but what's worse is what's even worse is the mailing label says unit whatever right so the person knows it's an apartment building you know you don't send swimming pool stuff to people who live in apartments Right, so you know, look at your mailing list, and when you buy a mailing list, make sure it's vetted. If you are a landscaper, you don't want any apartments or multifamily housing. You want just a single family residence. There are ways they can easily sort for that. It doesn't cost you a whole lot of money. Vet your mailing list. Make sure you're only dealing with the people that you, uh, you do. You know, I, I get the, you know, I get the biggest kick out of the ads on television, on, 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 on television. You know, sometimes they'll say, you know, hi, we're so-and-so, we do this, we do that, and se habla espanol. Right? They're trying to say, hey, we speak Spanish, we want the Hispanic community, right? Except there's only one problem. The rest of the ad's in English, right? So if you're a, a Spanish speaker, native Spanish speaker who does not speak English very well, the only thing you're going to understand is say, habla espanol. You're not going to understand the rest of it, which means you're not watching that ad. You're watching the Spanish language channel. You're not watching this thing, which is all in English. So the ad's a waste of time. What they're really looking for are people who speak English who know people who speak Spanish. And they're hoping that they're going to make that connection. I, it, it's not going to happen, okay? Um, okay, you, use, mailing, use flat mailing envelopes and real stamps, right? When you get the envelope with the glass thing in the front, the, the glass scene thing in the front, and a 19.8 cent, you know, bulk mailing stamp, you know it's junk mail. It looks like junk mail. The key to successful junk mail is to make it look like a regular letter from somebody you know. That's the key. Use flat mailing envelopes, real stamps. Thick is better than thin to a point. If it's too thick, 
then I know something, it looks like something from my broker, and I, and I throw it away. You know, those, 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 those proxy statements and stuff they send you that nobody ever looks at. Type, or better, handwrite the address. Use a residential return address, or better yet, no return address. That's even better. Think about it. You get an envelope in the mail with a regular stamp, handwritten address with the name spelled correctly, and no return address. You're going to open that, aren't you? Because you don't know what it is. It looks like something that could actually be important, right? So you open it up, and then you see it's from, you know, some insurance company or something like that. Ah, darn it. But at least you open the envelope, right? They got you that far. That's the key in junk mail is to get them to open the envelope, and that's how you do it. Make it look, take the time and make it look like a real thing. Don't make it look, don't use those auto pen things, you know, that looks like it's script, but it really isn't. I mean, you can, people can see right through that. Um, the cover letter is all important because that's all anybody, once they open it, you've got, again, 15 seconds. Just think of it as a stopwatch. Picture a stopwatch. The minute that letter, that thing gets open, you got 15 seconds to get your message across. So that's all the only, th uh, that's all the time the person's even going to look at it. And then give the recipient a freebie that's worth something. Uh, the best one, the best example I have of this, the Wall Street Journal did this a few years ago. They were doing a, 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 a customer survey of people who've been subscribers for more than 10 years, right? Well, they sent me a flat envelope from the Wall Street Journal, which was clearly not just a, there was something in it, it was substantial, so I opened it, and when I opened it, there was a letter and some stuff, and a crisp $5 bill paper clipped to the letter, a real one, not a, not a photo of, you know, one of those funny money things that you sometimes see. And the letter said, you know, dear Wall Street, dear Wall Street Journal subscriber, we realize your time is very valuable. Um, you know, we, are, we have a very important survey we, we really want you to do, and we realize your time is valuable, so we are giving you the $5 as, uh, as, as a reward, if you will, for please taking 10 minutes out of your life and filling in the, the survey and sending it back to us. Now, normally, I don't have time to do surveys. I don't have time. You don't have time, right? Most of you don't do them either, right? But this one I did. Why? I was guilty about accepting the five bucks and not doing something about it. You know, if it was just a penny or a dime or a return postage stamp, that's different. I don't have any guilt at all. I'll keep the stamp and throw everything else away. But five bucks, that's, that's too much. I, I, I'm not going to, I actually did the questionnaire. I actually took the time out. I did it and I mailed it back, you know, self-addressed stamped envelope and everything like that. I understand that their return rate on that was solicitation was over 70%. What is the typical return rate on a junk mailing? It's like a fraction of 1%, right? 70% of the people who got, who got that survey answered it. And I think the $5 bill had a lot to do with it. Of course, it cost them some money, you know, probably cost them a few thousand bucks, but hey, they're the Wall Street Journal. They can, they can, they can do that. They got the money. Uh, that's a great technique to do. Give them a little something. Give them a free, give them a freebie. Because uh, people feel guilty. People don't like being given gifts from strangers. Uh, they want to work for them. If, if you give somebody a gift that you don't know, they're more inclined, psychologists, some psychology behind this too, which I really don't know very well, but the idea is they feel guilty about accepting a gift from strangers, so they'll work to try to even the platform, to sort of give you something back so that the two of you are in more of a socially equal situation. Uh, I don't know the psychological term for that, maybe some of you guys do here, but it's a very effective technique. Give them something that they're not expecting. First of all, it gets their attention like nothing else, and it motivates them to do whatever it is you want them to do. Email and social media selling. Um, now here, obviously, I have to get a little legal here. This is the legal part here. Uh, you know that there are, there are anti-spam laws at both the federal and the state level here. We've got a pretty tough one here in Connecticut. Uh, the basic rules are when you're selling you know, blast emails or, 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 or blast tweets to people, uh, public tweets, customers always must, whenever you're directing things to people, they must be able to either opt in or opt out. Most people do an opt out. Uh, solution. And we'll send you this stuff. If you want to opt out, click the unsubscribe button at the bottom of the email. You have to do that, and the thing has to work. How many of you have had a situation where you got this junk email, you, it was an unsubscribe thing, you clicked it, and it went to an error 404 page or something like that? It, that bugs you, doesn't it? Make sure the link works. Make sure you're unsubscribed. Use Constant Contact, or there's a whole bunch of mailing list managers. Constant Contact's the most famous one. Use them because they have all that stuff. If they're doing your mailing list, all that stuff will be, they comply with the laws in all 50 states. You don't have to worry about what California's anti-spam statute is all about. They dealt with that. That's why you're in compliance, whatever it is. Um, the rules for email bests and tweets, you must give followers the chance to stop following you if they don't want to receive your tweets. Okay, that's very important. Again, this is directed tweets. You can always send a public tweet to the world at large. Uh, just make sure uh, you proofread it very carefully and make sure you get at least three second opinions before you send out a public tweet. Uh, public tweets can be very dangerous, uh, but you can send a public tweet. But if you're doing a directed tweet, 
to some people, to a bunch of hashtags. Um, you really shouldn't be sending directed tweets to people who have not registered as a follower or have ceased following you. You should only be communicating directed tweets to your followers on Twitter, nobody else. By all means, get as many followers as you can. By all means, put up some public tweets that make people want to follow you. Um, you know, uh, but, but don't send directed tweets to strangers. That's a sure way of, of getting the, uh, the Twitter authorities down on your throat. Your header. Header has to be compelling. When I'm, when I'm clicking the delete key on my email in the morning, this is how fast I am going. Okay, about four beats to a second. That's how fast. You've only got a split second to catch my attention. Make sure that header screams out at me, stop, don't hit that key, take a look at what this, what, what this one says, if that's what you're doing. That is the only way that people even look at those things. Nobody has time to do this. The header must be compelling, honest, and not misleading. Um, you know, personalize your email so there's a direct, so for example, when I send out, I um, mean, I do a couple of things where I'm sending out blasts. I always say, from Cliff Enico, at the very beginning. So people know it's me. You know, from Cliff Enico. I, this is not just some strange thing. If people hate me, of course, they'll still click me anyway, but at least they know, wait a minute, this is from an actual person. This is not some automated thing, some, robo, some robotics thing is doing this thing. Um, last but not least, job interviews. Job interviews are sales meetings. Uh, the 80%, 20% rule, uh, this is from one of my books. You, in any job interview, you should be doing less than 20% of the talking. The interviewer should be doing more than 80% of the total talking. The big mistake you make in job interviews is you give out too much information. So you end up saying things that are irrelevant to the job interview. You also say something that'll screen you out, too. And I've had job interviews years ago where uh, that actually happened, where I said something, I, I mean, I had, I mean, they were interested in me, they wanted to follow up, but I just happened to make an off-the-wall an, an off comment that hit a negative nerve with the interviewer, and that was the end of the interview right there, because I opened my mouth too much. Um, there's, a, there's a famous old story, it's actually a legal story, about a, about a trial lawyer. He's, in, he's involved in this case involving a barroom brawl where someone allegedly bit off the plaintiff's ear as, during this melee that happened at a local bar, right? So he's got on the witness stand the only, he's the uh, defendant's lawyer, and he gets up there, the one eyewitness that supposedly saw this whole thing happen. So he gets up there, he asks him a couple of questions, and then he asks, now let me ask you, did you see my client, you know, my client is accused of biting the plaintiff's ear off, did you see him bite the ear off? And the witness said, no, no I didn't. Now a smart lawyer would have known to shut up right there and sit down, but this guy didn't. He asked the next question, well then how do you know that my client uh, bit off the plaintiff's ear? Sir, I saw him spit it out. That's, you know, that's, that's, that's but, but, but actually, I, I'm told by lawyers who know that that's actually from a real case, like back in the 1800s or something like that. You, you got to be careful in job interviews not to ask the one question too many. That is, that is a problem. And just, you know, keep, I always tell people, keep your mouth shut, assume you have the job, you go in warm, friendly, smile, but low-key, not overly dynamic, too, because that turns some people off. They feel, they feel threatened. Uh, keep asking questions. Use as few words as possible. Avoid stock answers to questions. And be memorable, but not too memorable. And I'll close with this. When I was interviewing for a job out of law school, I really wanted to come back to New York. I was at Vanderbilt Law School down south in Nashville, Tennessee, and I really wanted to come back to New York. So I was sending resumes to, like, every firm in New York. And, and I had an experience. Um, I, I interviewed at this one firm. I was supposed to have a one, a one hour interview, but the interviewer was actually a fan of mine. Before I went to law school, in the, in the gap between college and law school, I had written for a daily newspaper in his hometown, and he remembered me. Uh, I was a crime reporter, actually. I, I wrote about, you know, chasing, I, I chased police cars and fire trucks for two years before I went to law school and started chasing other things. Um, I, uh, so he knew me and he remembered me from those days. So he says, hey, look, do you have some time? There's some other lawyers here that I think would like to meet you. So, oh, okay, sure. I ended up spending the whole morning at this firm. I wasn't, I was only scheduled for an initial interview, but they gave me a whole half a day. I met everybody on the, on the, uh, the, the personnel committee. Uh, they had a couple of young lawyers take me to lunch 
at the a famous steakhouse in New York in Midtown Manhattan where Muhammad Ali used to eat. That's the only thing I remember about the place. It was where he always used to go have lunch when he was in town. And, um, you know, they had pictures all over the place of celebrities. And we were talking about my days as a reporter, some of the crimes that I covered. I mean, we just had, you know, one of the best lunches I ever remember having in a long time. They brought me back to the firm. I mean, I had another interview that afternoon, but except for that, they would have had me there for the whole day. So they gave me this great send-off. Listen, don't worry, you're going to be in, we'll be in touch with you. I came out of that firm thinking, I had a job offer. I just, it just, everything was all positive there. Nothing bad happened. And then two days later, I got a standard rejection letter. The standard one, you know, the two sentence one that says, you know, thank you for coming. We're just not interested. And I, I mean, I, it floored me. I didn't know how to respond. You know, normally I didn't mind, I don't mind rejection, but I said, wait a minute, I actually called the personnel committee sec person's secretary. I, said, Did you, I just got this rejection. Do you remember who I was? I was the guy, I spent the whole day there. You took me to this place, you know, and, and nobody ever called me back. And I just, what the heck happened here? You know, what did I do wrong? You know, I, how did I blow this? It was, it was a perfect interview. So years later, I actually, at a, at a bar association convention, I actually met one of the attorneys who had interviewed me that day. And he remembered me. And I said, well, can I ask you a question? I was so floored after that whole day, I got a, a standard, like a two sentence rejection letter, not even a personal letter. It was just a standard, you know, rejection letter you send to people you don't even want to see. What happened here? And he goes, you know what, I'll tell you something. We spent a whole day talking about you. We spent a whole day talking about you. You, you really were a hit. I mean, we, lo we loved you. We thought you were fantastic. I said, yeah, but you rejected me. And he goes, yeah, and we did it for you. We did it as a favor to you. You did it as a favor to me? How was that? He goes, well, the work that we did at that firm at that time is this real, highly technical regulatory compliance. As a young lawyer in this firm, you would have spent the first two, three years of your career just poring over government regulations and federal register entries and things like that, looking to see, find little loopholes that our clients could benefit. You would have spent the whole first two to three years in our firm library. No one would have ever seen you. You wouldn't have had any client contact at all until year four or five after joining our firm. You were so dynamic and had such a personality and such an experience of life, which frankly very few of our attorneys had, we just felt you'd be bored out of your mind in a month and you probably would leave in the first few months after joining our firm. And we didn't want to waste your time and we didn't want to waste ours with that. You just, you were, I mean, a perfect fit intellectually and work-wise for the work that we were doing, but we just felt that you'd be bored out of your mind. We would much rather have had hired someone who didn't have so great a personality, who probably would, would have tolerated, you know, being, uh, being a drone in a basement for three years. Uh, so that was the motivation. It was probably the biggest backhanded compliment I ever received, but it also meant that I blew, and of course you could say, well, wait a minute, Cliff, you blew the interview, but you did it by being yourself, which is the, the right thing. You, it would have been a horrible fit. It probably would have been. I'm not saying that, but the fact is, be memorable, but don't be so memorable that you blow it. Because that can happen too. Sometimes you can be a little too forceful, a little too dynamic in situations where that's not required. Tailor your sales pitch to the situation always, and especially in job interviews. I mean, if you really, really want the job, you not only have to fit the, the technical requirements, but you also have to fit the culture too. Watch out for that. Don't, don't send signals that are contrary to the culture of the organization you're trying to join. So my key takeaway points, I know I've kind of covered a lot of grounds here. I know you got specific questions, and I'll try to answer as many of them as I can to the extent I can. It's about the customer's fears and passions. It's not about your product or service. Focus on that. Learn about the people you're talking to, and when you go in to, to do the cold call, lead with the fears and passions that you know they're feeling. Get them to feel them. You know, make them say, you know, I'm not thinking about this right now, but have you ever thought about what would happen if, uh, you know, so-and-so gets elected president and they double the estate tax and you're 65 years old and you've got a $5 million business? That's going to really have, really have an impact on you. Believe me, you got my ear at that point. If I'm a business owner and I'm 65, 70 years old, I'm thinking about the estate tax. And you just told me that one candidate's gonna double the estate tax. That's something I kinda wanna know more about. I'm not gonna hang up on you at that point. You know, um, uh, The first 15 seconds of a sales pitch are critical. You know, focus on that. Again, your goal is not to make a sale at that point. Your goal is just to not get rejected, to keep the door open long enough that you can get your message out. You know, develop a hook that will spark curiosity and forestall rejection for as long as possible, and avoid cold calling 
unless it's absolutely necessary. I haven't really changed my view on cold calling, guys. I mean, I, I can certainly give you some tips for how to improve your batting average, but it's still not a very effective way to sell. If you really want to know the more effective way of selling, watch my, my infamous how to sell video on youtube.com. It will take maybe an hour and 15 minutes out of your life, but people have told me it's changed their lives, and I'm hoping it will change yours as well. Uh, and you will never forget the purple sweater, if nothing else. These are two of my best-selling books. Uh, the Small Business Survival Guide is just a collection of some of my award-winning columns, and there's a lot of stuff in there about marketing and selling. Uh, and then this is another book that I've written specifically for eBay sellers. Some of you know, but I, I travel around the country speaking to eBay sellers, uh, mostly on legal and tax issues, you know, helping them with, you know, things like how to deal with disgruntled customers, how to pay sales taxes and comply with them and all that kind of stuff. And if you know anybody who sells on eBay or Amazon, this has become sort of the legal Bible for those folks. And that is what I look like. Okay, guys, you've been a very patient audience. Now I'll stop talking and give you guys a chance to, to ask some questions. Thank you very much, by the way. I really appreciate you doing this.